Well, we've worked our way through most of Galatians and uh, we're still in chapter 6. And it's got in it a principle that is absolutely vital for the times that we're, we're living in. And it's the principle of sowing and reaping. Uh, and so I just want us to spend a bit of time on that today uh, and try and, and get our heads around it and our hearts around it. Because I think it can really help us actually continue to to prosper and thrive in, in in seasons that we're living in right now so i've got basically got four points that i'm going to try and get through in the time without cramming it in too much oh my gosh uh, doing these 20 minutes is a is a real challenge for me i could tell you that uh, so my points are uh, first one trust this as a reliable principle point two is going to be keep sowing in troubled times Point three is please don't do this. And point four is a time when you don't reap what you sow, uh, where actually the principle doesn't apply fully. So uh, we're just going to read out of Galatians chapter six. I'm just going to read a couple of the verses here. Verse seven, do not be deceived. God can't be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, uh, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I mentioned uh, last time we talked about this, a key motivation for not giving up in times when we're getting a bit weary is this notion that actually sowing and reaping actually work and that there is a harvest to be reaped in proper time if we if we don't give up and i was thinking about farmers you know they what what is it about them you know they they take potatoes or wheat and they plant them in the ground and they're thoroughly convinced although or they wouldn't do it that they're going to get more potatoes out of the ground than they put in the ground or more wheat when they harvest than they sowed otherwise they just eat the potatoes and eat the wheat what's the point and I'm like, are they lying in bed at night going, oh, I've just got to believe that this wheat is going to reproduce. I've just got to believe that these seed potatoes are going to give me more potatoes. You know, if they stop believing, if they start to waver, does that mean that the potatoes aren't going to multiply? Well, of course it doesn't. The, 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 that principle of reproduction, that principle of sowing and reaping is written in creation. It's written throughout creation. One of the reasons it says that God isn't mocked in this issue of sowing and reaping is he doesn't violate his own principle. He's not going to be seen as the one guy that doesn't, uh, if you like, give you back what you have sown. He wants to be seen as the one who thought of the idea and is an abundant uh, supplier, uh, that, that you get an abundance back when you sow to him. So that, that that's kind of a context for this. But, but the faith thing is really interesting. The, the farmer, in a sense, does exercise faith because there he's got a seed potato. And he actually believes that the principle works. That's why he puts it in the ground. Then he goes and, you know, tills the field and does what he needs to do. But he's not anxiously wondering if the principle has work, worked. The, the, the principle is solid. And it is reliable. And so faith in this context is not trying to convince ourselves Oh, that we will reap, we will reap. We will reap. Faith is doing the sowing. Faith is doing the sowing. And what can put us off is if we start to doubt that sowing and reaping works, then we stop, we don't sow. Uh, and, and that can mean that in difficult times we think, oh, we're not going to bother with the sowing, which we'll look at a bit more in a minute. But the other thing that, that Christians are bad at is believing God wants to bless them. It's almost like, oh, I couldn't possibly give with the expectation of getting anything back. I couldn't possibly sow, expecting to get a reap some kind of stuff to me. No, it's got to be utterly altruistic with no hope of anything coming back to me. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Now, if a farmer lived like that, he'd be bankrupt in one year. He's not selfish or somehow poorly motivated sowing with an expectation of reaping and here God is clearly saying and in other parts of scripture saying sow with the expectation of reaping back even in uh, Jesus talks about those who've given up houses and families and to follow him and other things he says you're going to get them back a hundred times over 
in this life with persecutions to do the whole scripture. But Jesus isn't saying you've given, therefore you'll be impoverished. He's saying as you've given to me, as you've stepped out for me, as you've took a risk for me, if you sowed something important from your life into my purpose, you will reap back. And somehow we get in our minds that, well, that's not very spiritual. No, it's it's a principle he wants us to believe in because in the realm, just in the realm of giving, he wants us to give with the expectation that more will come back so that we can give more. And that principle of increase through sowing and reaping means that the kingdom can expand on the earth because the resources are increasing. Uh, so it's a reliable principle. We trust the principle, therefore we sow. Once we sow, we're believing for an outcome and we can believe for an abundant outcome. An abundant outcome is not a selfish, um, is not selfish ambition. It, it, it's biblical faith. It's totally great to do it with the expectation of more coming back so that you can then sow and that the increase thing in, it, it just gets some momentum behind it. So let's not be more spiritual than God. <laughs> uh, so that's a, it's a reliable principle. Let's trust it. Let's, let's work with it. Let's use it. Uh, I just want to talk, the second point is sowing in trouble. And I was just looking at different examples in the Bible and I actually looked in church history of, of famines and uh, persecutions and obviously pandemics. And there's a couple of famine instances in the Bible that really can inform us in, in the troubled times and uncertain times that we live in. Um, I believe really the summary of this is invest and give in troubled times. Because uh, if you turn to, uh, in your own time, Genesis 26 and verse 12 you see that Isaac if you read the context is seems to be in a time of famine God tells Isaac don't go to Egypt to escape the famine stay stay where you are and it says that in the same year he sowed and reaped a hundredfold and so became very wealthy he became so wealthy that that he became a problem to the people that he was living among but what's happening here is he he exercises the principle of sowing and reaping even in a famine for everybody else and God blesses his sowing with some reaping and so he prospers. I mean, some people say that that, um, that it's in recessions that millionaires are made. These are people who have cottoned on to something here which is this is the time to take a risk. This is the time to make an investment. This is the time to think about expanding your business where it's uncertain and maybe other people are pulling out. It's time to hold your nerve, actually. If you're in business, it's a real time to hold your nerve, to plan ahead. But it's also a time to develop yourself, take, take, a new, uh, you know, something, take a new course, read a new book. It's time to invest, even in a season of uncertainty and difficulty, because the favor of God on our lives means we are going to reap as we invest in these, in these troubled time so it's not a time just to lock down shut down and not think of creative things to do with our lives this is a time to to invest it's a time to develop business it's a time to develop ourselves and trust God that out of doing that in a time of kind of famine that we're going to reap many times over and the other t time that you see in the Bible is uh, in famine is in the book of Acts where Agabus the prophet comes to Antioch in chapter 11 and he prophesies a famine to the whole of the, of the Roman world which includes Antioch where they are and, uh, and they trust this prophet and, uh, and the, the text, the Bible text tells us that this famine took place but it looks like just before it's about to take place they take up an offering to send to their, their sister churches down in the region of Judea. So What's their, res their response to impending famine isn't to pull their horns in and become less generous. It's actually to become more generous uh, because they believe in a God who looks after them. Their first instinct is to look after their brothers and sisters in Judea. So actually a time of famine, a time of pressure on us is is the time not just to take initiative and invest it's also a time to give because God is always giving return on our giving giving is a form of sowing uh, 
2 Corinthians tells us that, that as we sow, we will reap. This is a time to, to not lose heart and give as we are able to give, to stretch, to, to see him do these things. I know back in 2008 in the, in the, in the crash then, I remember trees are phoned up that we give and support uh, uh, children in different parts of the, uh, uh, the depri deprived areas of the world. And she phoned up the people that we, we channel that money through and they said, oh, you, do you want to cancel? Because people were ringing up and canceling. And she said, no, we want to take somebody else on. And they were completely shocked. But we were applying this this principle to our lives. And, and I know I was, I was privileged to be in a conversation with with quite a few others with Bill the other day and this is so ingrained in, in uh, Bill Johnson so ingrained in the Bethel church culture that actually in this pandemic season because particularly their business people have caught hold of this the income of the church has gone up and not down this is because people know this is a time to sow this is a time to invest this is a time to give um, that's what we do it's like upside down kingdom it's the opposite of what the flow seems to be telling us to do it's a good troubled times are a good time to sow and see god give you a gracious powerful increase on what you sow in due time that phrase is really important because it can happen straight away but sometimes it, it, it it's for later on but in the right time you will sow i know what we went through in 2008 our whole sort of financial structure of our family could have collapsed but it didn't. God saved us. All kinds of different provision things happened that, that it all worked out for us. So thank, thank God for that. Amazing, actually, that we got through all of that. Um, third thing is don't sow this. So, <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? Well, the, the passage we're reading says basically sow to the spirit, don't sow to the flesh because you're going to reap back whichever, whichever direction you start to sow and you're going to you're going to get back from that. So don't, don't sow to the sinful nature is what, what Paul is saying in this text. Don't, don't, and the context is actually about keeping the rules and self-effort as a means of salvation. So don't sow to self-absorption. Don't sow to self-promotion. Don't sow to, to uh, self-improvement. Don't, don't sow to selfishness because Chapter 5 says we serve one another because of our freedom. So he, he's trying to get us to sow not into sinfulness, not into self-indulgence and getting our eyes on ourselves, which in pressured times we're more prone to do. He's saying sow to the Spirit because out of the Spirit you reap life. What does that look like for us? Well, that means we sow in serving one another. We sow in loving people well. We sow in, we sow in feeding ourselves spiritually so in prayer and reading the bible and speaking in tongues we just build ourselves up in the holy spirit we're sowing to the spirit we're worshiping we are we are doing things that enliven our our, our spiritual life that was and strengthen the spiritual life that's in us and from that we will reap a reward we will reap fullness of the spirit we will bear spiritual fruit because fruit happens the fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians 5, as Joe was talking uh, to us about, comes out of our abiding in Christ. It's that drawing his nutrients through us and in us means that his life and his fruit flows out of us. So to that, those ways that you enjoy and realize and develop your deep and profound connection with Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So to that, a new world have encounters you will reap joy you will reap peace you will reap the fruit of the spirit so please don't sow to the flesh because that is something else that you reap and you really don't want to be reaping the death and dullness that comes out of that self preoccupation and 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 there is in this sowing and reaping cycle which is written in creation it's written it's a spiritual principle it's a natural principle it's written through the whole thing we live in it you know my body is a fruit of what i've sown into it look at this <laughs> i did manage to lose some weight in lockdown because i sowed a bit less into it how about that there is one there's an exception to this though there's a if you like a great there's a higher principle still than sowing and reaping and it's called redemption 
Because Jesus died on a cross and rose again from the dead, he put it he put like a full stop into the reproductive ability of some things we do in our lives. So at the cross our sins are forgiven. If we come to him and repent and ask him to forgive us, you know what? We are forgiven. And so many of the things that could keep going on in our life, the, the things we could keep reaping, stop because we've turned to him and turned away from our old life. And, and the grace of God and the kindness of God is this, that actually he redeems us out of many of the consequences of the stupid stuff that we were doing because of his death and resurrection. Because as we turn to him, he starts to work things out for our good because we're called according to his purpose. I know, just think, just think of it like this way. Practically, this is, this is where this works out. So, say in your life, you have abused your body. Say, say you've done, you, you've done non-prescription drugs uh, or, or alcohol to the point where your liver is shot. That's sowing and reaping. But you know, Jesus will heal your liver. Jesus will heal your body. He's not persuaded by all the list of reasons we have why he shouldn't do it because of how bad we have abused ourselves. He, he will heal us. Say, say we've got, and I know I've seen that happen with people. And the same with money. You know, we can do foolish things with money. We can get ourselves in a hole. You know, I know people there that's happened and the hole has been serious. And then they've turned to God to start to sort their life out. And guess what? He has supernaturally dealt with their debt. I know it's not fair, is it? But that's grace. That's the kindness of God. That's redemption. All that stuff that we did that was getting us in a fix, spiritually, emotionally, he can redeem us. And he can start a new train of events in our life where we start to enjoy him. It is, it is resting on us, turning to him, and away from doing the more foolish stuff. But as we do that, he's, he's, he has this way of redeeming our mistakes. I mean, just say, say you, you just ended up in a place where you had a, a, a baby out of wedlock and you just feel it, oh. Uh, then you come to yourself and you think, oh, what, what's going on? Uh, whether, whether you're the father or the mother of this child, oh, what have I done? You know, you're a Christian. and or you turn to him. He can redeem you. He's not going to get rid of the baby, but he can redeem your life. He can give you a new start. He can create an amazing family testimony out of what was a really difficult place. He can remove the shame. He can take your life forward. He can make sure that you're not just stuck in a hole because that's the nature of the goodness of God. That's the nature of redemption. It's almost like there's a higher principle, which is as we connect to God, he works all things together for good. It's, it says that. He works all things together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. He starts to drag us out of the slipstream of the negative consequences of the life that we lived and starts to give us a redeemed life. Starts to turn things that were black in, and bleak into good and into gold. He He is the ultimate redeemer. So... I don't know what mistakes you have made. I don't know what things may have gone wrong through you or to you, but he can redeem that. He can redeem that. He can change that. He can lift you up. He can give you what you need. He can give you and does give you a future and a hope because he's a God of redemption, the God who died for you and rose again for you so that life's mistakes don't have to keep being your inheritance. You get a new start. Uh, and he's got great plans for you. So thank you for for listening to this. Those are our those are our four points. Remember, sowing and reaping. Trust it. It's a reliable principle. Remember to in this season be someone who sows, who gives, who invests. Remember not to sow to the flesh. Don't don't. There's some things not to sow to. And remember, ultimately. Things have gone wrong in your life. You've made a mess. When you turn to him, that process of, of repentance introduces this thing called redemption. God 
breaks in and stops the cycle of sowing and reaping and starts to make good things out of the bad things. He's that gracious, that powerful, that amazing. So, so let's pray as we close. So Father, thank you today for, for being with us. You're with us all the time and we just enjoy your company. And I pray for anybody who's listening to this who's, who's made a mess, who's made a mess in their life and they're just thinking, well, I don't deserve help. I don't deserve to be out of debt. I don't deserve a decent life. I don't deserve a great family. I don't deserve to be healed because of that. You would crack that off them right now and they would receive your goodness, receive grace for healing, for redemption from debt, for building a great family, for building a great business, even if the last one went bust. All those kind of things, God, let there be a turning. And also let faith grow for reaping where we're sowing great things that people keep sowing in these difficult times, let their faith be buoyant and that that would be something that keeps us from weariness. In Jesus' name, amen.